Thanks, Ashkan, and uh, it's great to be here again uh, this year. Uh, this is my third float conference, and it seems like uh, every year it just gets uh, better and better. Um, and for me in particular, I think uh, this year is probably uh, my favorite conference yet because we have some real data to show you today. So um, I know that uh, we've already seen a lot of data um, earlier in Justin's talk. Um, I hope you'll get sort of strapped in uh, and we're gonna sort of surf some data together. Um, I'll try to take a pause at you know, some opportune times to kind of contextualize things. Uh, but I'm really excited to show you today uh, the results of the first uh, clinical trial involving eating disorders. So, uh, let's see, the clicker doesn't seem to be working. Ah, there we go, okay. So, um, the outline for today's talk, uh, I'm gonna talk first and foremost about uh, why would we study uh, floating and eating disorders, um, sort of outline some methods for the study that uh, we ran recently at the Laureate Institute for Brain Research. We'll talk about uh, the results of the study uh, and then sort of the implications. Um, and first and foremost, I think that uh, as a clinician, um, motivation for doing any study, um, for trying to explore the potential clinical benefits of, of any intervention, really starts with uh, the patient, with the individual who is experiencing suffering, who's experiencing symptoms. And um, specifically with eating disorders, uh, I think that most of you are probably aware uh, of a very um, uh, prominent uh, experience uh, of somebody who had an eating disorder, uh, Emily Norin, who wrote a book about this. Um, and this is just some comments from her book um, about the uh, uh, positive benefit that she derived as an individual affected by an eating disorder. So she said, floating literally quieted the constant noise and chaos, allowed my body to rest, and my mind to wander through the caves and tunnels of my unconscious, my most valuable tool for recovery, happiness, and health. Okay. And with respect to some of the specific symptoms of eating disorders, particularly the aspects of eating food, uh, really for her she emphasized that the most difficult part about eating food was sitting with this feeling of fullness. And since the feeling of emptiness was my, was my normal and it felt soothing and safe, this feeling of fullness was extremely uncomfortable. So much so that it was impossible to distract myself from how fat I felt. If I followed a meal with a float, however, I could allow my food to digest without the discomfort of fullness. So in previous years, we've talked a, a lot about uh, how uh, floating alters the balance of external and internal environmental stimuli, sensory stimuli. Uh, here was an anecdotal uh, example of how uh, an, the interoceptive experience of eating um, was quieted and was made more tolerable um, with floating. So um, here's uh, how we think about floating in the brain. So you have a cerebral cortex, um, which processes lots and lots of information from outside and inside the body. Uh, and when you enter a float environment, you are attenuating visual input. Um, here are some general areas of the brain that are involved. Um, you, you attenuate uh, auditory, proprioceptive, tactile sensation, movement, and speech. Um, and the question really here is, um, as a consequence, how does being in this environment, both uh, individually and then after repeated sessions, um, how does floating potentially modulate some of these sensations and some of these symptoms in a way that could be relevant for eating disorders. So I'll try to make that case for you a little bit more. Um, we focus a lot on interoception because in the absence of a lot of these other sensory stimuli, um, it seems uh, in uh, most of the unaffected individuals that we've studied, um, the interoceptive sense uh, is enhanced. So the study that I'm going to talk about is really a study of anorexia nervosa, which is one of numerous eating disorders that are available uh, to be diagnosed in an individual. Um, we started with anorexia nervosa because uh, it's a fairly homogenous, it's sort of people who come in with the disorder have a lot of the same symptoms, um, and uh, it's a disorder that I've personally studied uh, for a number of years now and have a lot of experience with. 
But let's look at sort of some of the symptoms of anorexia nervosa. So first thing you have to know is that it's a rare but deadly disease. So it affects less than 1% of the population, approximately 10 to 1 female to male. Um, but it's deadly, so it has a mortality rate over the long term of, of almost 20%. So that puts it um, on an even playing field with disorders like schizophrenia, with disorders like bipolar disorder. Um, these uh, individuals who have eating disorders, particularly anorexia nervosa, um, can really die because of the illness. Um, another challenge is that current treatments really only have moderate efficacy. So there's not a single treatment out there right now um, that shows a preponderance of clinical benefit. Um, usually you try one treatment. If that doesn't work, you try another, or you try combinations of medication and psychotherapy. Unfortunately, medications are fairly unhelpful. Um, even medications that are helpful for other kinds of psychiatric disorders, anxiety and depression, don't seem to work uh, very well with anorexia nervosa. So um, there's really sort of a, a need uh, to investigate new uh, interventions. Some of the clinical features uh, that we see in the clinic all the time, uh, the first one that's the most obvious is severe food restriction um, causing distinct weight loss. So these aren't people who skip one meal here and there or who are going on a diet and sort of cutting back on their calories a little bit. These are people who rigidly adhere to a very, very limited amount of food that they will eat, and it makes them lose weight, and it's readily apparent to anyone uh, even on the street. Uh, accompanied by that, they have an intense fear of weight gain. So uh, the idea of eating food um, is uh, often assumed to immediately result in the deposition of fat and the deposition of um, an increase in body size. Uh, and accompanying that, uh, these individuals often have a substantial disturbance in how they see themselves. Literally, when they look in the mirror, when everybody else sees somebody who's slender, this is what they see. Okay? They see a, a larger image of themselves, um, and that uh, appears to be connected with how they represent their own body image in the brain. Uh, other symptoms that are not necessarily linked to the disorder, uh, the, to the diagnosis of the disorder, but are very uh, common, are anx uh, anxiety, obsessionality, and perfectionism. These are uh, sort of trait-like characteristics. Um, there are certainly lots of people who have more anxiety uh, or more obsessionality but don't have anorexia nervosa or don't have any other kind of disorder. But these three typically are, are highly elevated uh, in patients with AN. Um, and emerging research uh, in my lab and in other labs is really starting to show that these individuals seem to have a difficulty recognizing both their own internal body sensations as well as uh, emotional states. So why floating and why anorexia nervosa? Well, these are the clinical features. This is the clinical problem. And floating seems to possibly uh, modulate, modulate or uh, operate on several of these uh, symptoms. So Justin just finished giving a very nice illustration of how floating uh, uh, attenuates anxiety, how a single float session can do that. Um, but I'm interested in sort of this uh, idea of body image disturbance. This is actually one of the last things to, to change in treatment, um, as well as how floating might uh, alter uh, internal body sensations and emotional experience. And so that's what we'll go through today. Um, this is a clinical trial, um, but one thing that uh, you have to understand about clinical trials is that um, they're fairly slow. Uh, it takes a long time to do it right. Um, and you usually don't start by hitting a home run. So uh, when Justin was talking about uh, conducting a randomized controlled trial, uh, oftentimes uh, there are several studies that lead up to that point where you learn more about the intervention, you learn more about the population. Um, if you think about testing a new treatment, um, like he was saying earlier, we want to know, uh, is floating safe? Uh, do people have adverse side effects, et cetera? So this uh, study that I'm going to present to you today is more of a safety study. Um, and our basic hypothesis, uh, I talked about this study a little bit last year, um, is that floating is safe for individuals with anorexia nervosa. Um, so the idea of uh, floating in a reduced uh, environment is not going to make the symptoms of the disorder worse. Um, and uh, I'll show you several ways that we uh, examine this. So the methods for the current study 
Um, there's several sort of predictions um, that drive the methods, right? So uh, the first thing is that we really are interested in seeing whether there are any adverse physical uh, effects of floating. Um, it turns out that um, these patients, when they're very underweight, can feel dizzy. They can have lots of blood pressure changes when they go from lying down to, to sitting or standing, uh, kind of when you get out, if you've ever felt sort of dizzy on a hot day when you stood up. Um, so we want to make sure that they don't have any uh, effects like that. Um, but then we're also interested in sort of in seeing whether there are, uh, is an impact of floating on symptoms of anxiety, uh, on stress, uh, on mood, uh, and of course on body image. Um, we don't rule out the possibility of positive effects, but this study was not specifically designed um, to test um, the presence of positive effects, okay? So um, if you think of a clinical trial as a, um, as a trumped up hypothesis test, um, you can really only test one hypothesis, so you can only have what's called one primary outcome. So our outcome in this uh, is really more about physical uh, effects and safety, um, whereas we have some other secondary outcomes uh, that I'll explore and I'll show to you today. Uh, within this range of physical uh, effects of floating, we really uh, are going to focus very, very closely on blood pressure, uh, and specifically blood pressure drops, uh, and I'll explain that uh, Next. So what we're really looking for in this study is, does floating induce something called orthostatic hypotension? Uh, what that really means is simply a fall in your blood pressure when you stand up, okay? So uh, if you imagine uh, that this is your body and, and this blue level here indicates your total blood volume, right? Um, if your total blood volume is uh, low, uh, when you stand up, the volume drops, okay? So if you're not fully hydrated, um, if you've ever stood up on a, on a sunny day and, uh, or a hot day and you felt a little dizzy, um, that's because your blood volume shifts when you stand up and causes something called orthostatic hypotension. Patients with eating disorders, uh, especially who are underweight, are notoriously at risk for this and they can actually fall and hurt themselves, they can bre break bones, uh, et cetera. So, this is the physiology of orthostatic hypotension. So when you stand up, the blood literally uh, is pulled away from your heart by gravity. Uh, it pools in your veins and your abdomen. You have sensors in your arteries, in your carotid arteries, which are on the neck, uh, and also in the aorta, which is right next to the heart right here, which don't respond to the um, fall in uh, blood pressure, to the fall in your blood volume away from the heart. Um, and this is really a, a problem of the autonomic nervous system where the heart uh, fails to beat faster to compensate. So the autonomic nervous system doesn't really tell the body, hey, you know, there's something changing. Um, you gotta adjust to this. And the consequence is this lightheadedness or dizziness, literally because blood uh, is not flowing to the brain uh, at high enough of a level, okay? So uh, in the context of this study and, and sort of a standard way that uh, in the hospital, uh, we uh, assess for orthostatic hypotension um, is a very concrete measurement. So a drop uh, of 20 millimeters of mercury in systolic blood pressure, which is kind of that top number. If you've seen like the patient has 120 over 60, right, or something like that, that's the top number. So you, you look for a drop of 20 beats or, or 20 millimeters of mercury or more. Uh, or you look for a drop in the diastolic blood pressure um, of 10 millimeters of mercury or more. So what you look for is when the person goes from lying to standing or sitting to standing, a drop in that level. Um, and uh, at the Laureate Institute for Brain Research, we have uh, an um, adolescent and an adult uh, inpatient eating disorders um, unit two floors above us. And um, this is a very real concern that, uh, that the clinicians have with the patients. So um, frequently I will see patients um, being wheeled around in a wheelchair. Um, and the reason is that they are, that day, they're orthostatic and um, they're considered at um, an increased fall risk if they were to be walking around and getting up. So uh, this is really a, a key safety variable um, that is something uh, we wanted to measure, clinically relevant. So uh, here's how the study uh, was set up. Um, participants came in and, and they consented. Um, they did a psychiatric evaluation with myself or Dr. Scott Moseman, who is the director of the Laureate Eating Disorders Program. Um, and then they did a behavioral assessment. They filled out a lot of questionnaires, et cetera. 
And then they came in for a float. Um, and the first float that we had them do uh, was float in this zero gravity chair that we've presented uh, to you in the past at the float conference. Um, and we did that for a very specific reason, because we wanted to see, first of all, um, could people tolerate being uh, supine for 90 minutes? Uh, our floats were 90 minutes. We also uh, used it as an opportunity to measure their orthostatic blood pressure uh, while they were clothed and while we had uh, uh, my research coordinator, who's a nurse, uh, with them so that we could make sure that they did not um, show evidence of orthostasis before we put them into a float uh, tank without anybody uh, in the room. So that was the first float. Uh, our second float uh, was in the open pool. Uh, and uh, as Justin has mentioned before, we have uh, psychiatric patients start in the open pool in case they have claustrophobia. Um, but we have also this uh, enclosed or this domed pool at LIBOR, and uh, many of you uh, know that um, you can change the humidity and you have a little bit finer control over some of the environmental aspects. So we wanted to make sure that we also uh, used sort of more of a, uh, a standard uh, setting. And we wanted to do it twice so we could really get a, a good sense as to uh, what would the uh, effects be. Um, so this was not a randomized clinical trial or RCT. This was a fixed order. Um, this was also not blinded. There's no uh, treatment condition. Um, this is a sequential open label where everybody in the study started in the chair, then they went to the open pool, and then to the enclosed pool. Okay. And again, what we're looking at are um, uh, measures of physical safety. So uh, what we measured was uh, orthostatic blood pressure. We also measured heart rate and EEG. Um, we did the same thing in the open pool. Um, and you know, by this point in the study design, we were thinking to ourselves, you know, we don't really have, um, uh, we haven't really given somebody a, a normal experience of floating because this blood pressure cuff is going off every 10 minutes. So we thought, let's give everybody just sort of a um, float without any sensors attached. Um, so that it would be a little bit more comparable to something that you might experience in the community. And then finally, uh, with the fourth float, we measured these um, devices uh, again. I'm not going to show uh, or discuss any uh, data related to heart rate or EEG, but we will talk about the blood pressure, which was the primary outcome of the study. So uh, it turns out uh, measuring these uh, variables is very important. You have to do it in a standardized way. We had people uh, where we measured everybody from lying to sitting to standing in that order, and we waited exactly three minutes in between so that you, we could allow the person's um, autonomic nervous system to adjust to the positional constraints. This is sort of a standard approach in the clinic. Um, and then we measured uh, blood pressure before and after uh, the float. Um, and when I say after the float, I mean literally while they were still in the pool, okay? So in order to do that, we had, to do, uh, we had to use a couple different devices. So this is an example of the device that we used. This is sort of what you'll see in the hospital if you ever have a loved one who's, who's there and they're getting their vital signs measured. Um, this is obviously not compatible with a float tank. You can't take it in uh, to the water. Um, so we used uh, the same uh, Bluetooth uh, waterproof device that um, Justin has been using. Um, and we measured uh, blood pressure uh, before uh, uh, the float using the standard clinical device and then using the float comp compatible device. Um, and so then we can compare the two. Um, this is sort of the timeline for our study. It took uh, our participants about three and a half hours um, from start to finish. So this was kind of a long, uh, intensive data collection. Uh, but these are the procedures. So they came in, uh, they filled out some questionnaires to assess their baseline state. They took a shower. Then we measured their pre-float orthostatics with both the clinical standard and then the float compatible device. We applied our sensors, uh, and then we had them float. Uh, again, all floats were 90 minutes. Uh, immediately afterwards, we measured their orthostatic vital signs again. They took a shower, and then they filled out some questions, and they completed an interview. So uh, here's the results. Are you guys all with me? All right. So. Let's get to the data. Four floats in 10 minutes. All right. So um, first of all, uh, this study was approved by the Western Institutional Review Board. Um, we also registered the study on clinicaltrials.gov. 
So if you uh, go to that website, you can look up sort of all the variables that I've just described for you. Um, this is a, a standard way of ensuring quality, uh, and so that when you submit these results for publication, the reviewers can look back and say, oh, okay, well, what did you actually say you were going to do at the beginning of the study, and how did that relate to what you actually found and what you actually measured? So you can find it there. Um, and these are, uh, this was who completed the study. So we, we, with the help of the Laureate Eating Disorders Program, we contacted over 55 people. And over the course of a little more than a year, uh, we consented 23 and completed uh, four floats in 21 individuals. We had two people who dropped out uh, after their second float. So each of them did have an experience of floating in the open pool. But 21 individuals, um, okay. So what are their characteristics? Uh, they're on average 26 uh, years old. Um, as you can see, the majority of them are female, which is consistent with what you find uh, epidemiologically. Um, nearly a college uh, education. Uh, importantly, they all had a normal uh, current body mass index. So we recruited people specifically who were not on the inpatient unit, but people who were in the community who uh, we were sure uh, were unlikely to have orthostatic uh, hypotension and who uh, sort of you could think of as, as like the walking well, just to get an initial sense uh, of uh, floating in this population. Um, nevertheless, uh, they had uh, elevated um, eating disorder symptoms. They also had elevated trait anxiety. Um, uh, and they also had e uh, evidence of residual body image disturbance, which, as I said before, is probably the last thing that changes even after people normalize their weight. So uh, before I show you the results of the primary outcome measure, uh, just a reliability check. So we're going to compare we're going to really rely on the uh, float-compatible wireless Bluetooth blood pressure device that you won't see in the hospital, um, but we're going to uh, look for the reliability between that and the clinical standard um, to see whether it's even reasonable um, to try and trust this device um, in making any conclusions. So, um, and the good news is, is I think that we can. So when you look at uh, systolic blood pressure, uh, this shows literally every float session um, and where we measured orthostatics. Um, this is actually lying down, this is sitting, and this is standing. Um, and these are the two devices. When, and what you can see is that overall, um, there's a very high degree of correlation uh, between the values. Anything above 0.7 is traditionally considered to be acceptable. And the same is true for the diastolic blood pressure. So everything that I'll show you from now on is, is using the wireless Bluetooth device. Um, if you remember our criteria for orthostasis is that 20 uh, millimeter mercury drop. So again, you're looking for whether the blood pressure dropped uh, the systolic blood pressure by 20. Um, these are the individual float sessions, the chair and the pool one and pool three where we collected blood pressure during the float and afterwards. And what you're looking for is, does anybody show a drop of more than 20? So these are each of the individual 21 participants so minus 20 would be kind of down here. And does anybody see any dots sort of falling off the graph? No. OK, so we, we saw no evidence of orthostatic hypotension in this sample using the systolic blood pressure as the criteria. Um, so again, that's our primary outcome measure. Uh, how about diastolic blood pressure? Um, we see the same thing. So here, we're looking for 10 millimeters of mercury. We don't see any uh, drop uh, of less than 10 millimeters of mercury. In fact, what we tend to see, if anything, is in the pool, the blood pressure actually tends to rise a little bit when people stand up. Um, if we go back and we look at the groups, um, here's the group blood pressure for systolic blood pressure. So this is pre, from lying to sitting to standing in the chair lying, sitting, standing, post-chair, you can see that it actually stays pretty level. Um, whereas in the two pool conditions, here's post-pool one and post-pool two, you can see that actually rather than dropping, which is what we would be concerned about, um, we see a very healthy and vigorous uh, increase in blood pressure. So this, again, is an indication that the autonomic nervous system is doing what it needs to be doing. And we see the same thing uh, in the systolic blood pressure. So the difference in the diastolic, I'm sorry. So you can see diastolic increasing from lying to sitting to standing. So that's good news, right? So we, we have kind of initial evidence that uh, 
um, uh, across multiple floats, um, this patient population is not showing evidence of orthostasis. How about during the float? So we have multiple conditions that we can look at. We can look at our, um, the, the zero gravity chair condition, and this is what you would see. So um, blood pressure uh, starts out uh, a little bit on the lower side compared to what you would expect from the normal population. Normal blood pressures tend to be around 120 over 70-ish. That would be kind of considered normal. Whereas here you can see that this patient population is starting somewhat low, about 102. Um, and uh, this is just the average blood pressure. Um, and these uh, vertical lines just show, re reflect the um, standard error. So it's a measure of the variability. It's not the same as the confidence interval that Justin talked about. Um, but it just gives you a sense of sort of how much wiggle room there is from the mean. And overall, what you can see is that in, with floating and systolic blood pressure, the blood pressure is about the same. In the pool, however, we see that before their first float, um, their patient's blood pressure was actually somewhat elevated. Uh, and then it takes about 20 minutes or so before it starts to decrease. It kind of changes a little bit, um, goes back down. Uh, whereas in the third float, you can see that it just pretty much immediately levels out, right? And that looks a lot more similar, I think, to uh, the, the graph that you saw um, with the anxiety patients. Um, we see a very similar thing with diastolic blood pressure. So again, their diastolic is a little bit lower. Um, if anything, it kind of increases across uh, the float itself in the chair. Um, starts out a little bit higher uh, in the first pool and then comes down uh, and maybe decreases even a little bit more in the third pool. So if I had to characterize uh, overall the similarities between the anxious patients and the eating disorder patients, I would say that the, the direction of the autonomic uh, change in terms of blood pressure is similar. Um, but what you see is sort of evidence of an accumulation over time in this population. Okay, so those are all the primary outcome measures, um, but we do have these other secondary outcome measures which are fairly exploratory, uh, and I'm gonna race through these at lightning speed, but uh, before I do that, are you guys ready? All right. So uh, in order to interpret these graphs, you just really need to know two things. One is this uh, black line, you can think of this as, as no change, sort of your, your sort of zero level. Um, Justin already did a very nice job of introducing this idea of the POMP score, the percentage of maximum possible change on the scale. It's a way of equating uh, the degree of change that's possible um, and comparing it across measures. So what you're going to look for in these graphs is, is the change going above zero or is it going below zero? Okay, so let's go. And remember, we have four floats. So the first is the chair, open pool, and then the two closed pools over time. Okay, first thing is negative affect seems to decrease slightly across the board, okay? Um, these are statistically significant. Positive affect doesn't seem to change much with the chair, but you see this sort of linear effect where uh, it increases uh, statistically significantly by the fourth float, okay? Positive affect gets better. Joviality doesn't change a whole lot early on, but you see it changes uh, the most at the end. Fatigue sort of decreases across the board. And serenity increases both with the chair and the two pool conditions, but you see the largest effect, uh, almost 30%, um, with the final float. So the largest effect with the final float. How about stress and anxiety? It's the same sort of graph. Uh, you can see that energy increases kind of across the board. Relaxation also increases across the board, but again, you see this finding where with the fourth float, the final float, you have uh, the most accumulation of effect over time. Same with feelings of refreshment. Uh, and stress, again, seems to show the greatest decrease by the fourth float in these patients. How about interoceptive sensation changes? We've talked a lot about that over the years. Well. Uh, in this population, you get about a 10% increase in uh, the feeling of the heartbeat, uh, as well as the breath. Uh, 
But the stomach, interestingly, doesn't seem to show uh, a, uh, as much of a change. So this, uh, if anything, it decreases a little bit in the chair, but doesn't really seem to show a, a change in the intensity of the sensations over time, uh, which I thought is kind of interesting. It, it may match up somewhat with uh, Emily Noren's findings uh, from her own personal experience. Um, we also looked at the affect. So this is a little bit different. We didn't have a pre and post to look at a change. This is sort of 50 would be um, them indicating uh, that a, a neutral level of pleasantness or unpleasantness um, across the float. So you can see that the um, pleasantness of the heart doesn't increase from the float, uh, whereas breathing sensations actually seem to, to increase somewhat, although not a clear pattern. Uh, and again, you see this sort of odd, uh, not a clear linear pattern, but you see a, a, a hint at some decreases in the pleasantness of affect, but this is on a range from zero to 100. So it, some decrease with some of the floats, but not a clear substantial decrease across all the floats. All right, getting towards the end. Are you guys with me? All right, so uh, body image disturbance. Okay, so again, black line, you're looking for things that increase or decrease. So we had several different measures of body image. Um, the first one related more to feelings of attractiveness, of self ratings of attractiveness, um, called the body image state scale. You can see that across the board, there's a tendency to maybe report feeling a little bit less attractive, but this is not statistically significant. We had another scale where people were, were rating um, their physical body size, okay, called the photographic figure rating scale. And here, in the first thing we found is that when, when they looked at a, a, a series of silhouettes and they rated, you know, what, out of these different silhouettes from underweight to overweight, which one represents most closely your ideal body image? Um, there's actually a tendency to, uh, a small tendency to choose the body that was a little bit larger than they had before the float. That was their ideal body image. When you look at uh, their current body image, so they looked at the same pictures and they said, pick the figure that, that best shows what your body looks like right now. This is what they picked. So you can see that they actually, across all the floats, uh, picked a more slender body. Okay. And when you combine the two scores into something called a body image dissatisfaction, sort of so this, the subtraction of the two, you can see that um, body dissatisfaction actually decreases um, across uh, all the conditions. And you can see this sort of linear trend where with the pool, it's, it's continuing to decrease. What does that look like from the perspective of a single person? Well, these are the actual images. So this is a hypothetical example of a patient whose body actually looks like this, okay? And in the uh, pre-float state, you can think of this more as sort of like what somebody who's acutely experiencing the symptoms of the disorder would say that even, even though their body actually looks like this, they think their body looks more like this. This would be the image that they would pick. And then if you ask them to rate what they think their body should look like, this is what they would pick. Okay, so um, they would pick a more overweight body um, relative to what their current body looks like and think that their ideal body should look even more uh, emaciated. And so the kind of change in body image dissatisfaction, um, I'll, I'll illustrate right here, um, this is what they looked like before the float, and this would be more like what they looked like after the float. So you can see that after the float, the person's body, their actual body hasn't changed shape, but they're picking a current body that is more closely similar to their own body, um, and also rating an ideal body that is um, closer to their own body and less emaciated. In terms of effect sizes, right? Justin talked about this and showed you uh, the comparison of effect sizes across the different conditions. So now we wanna see how much do our results in the eating disorder um, population relate to patients with anxiety. So this is a subset of the uh, effect sizes that uh, he showed you before. Again, anything in uh, red or blue is considered very large. Um, so this is the anxious group. Um, this is the first uh, chair float, and you can see that uh, with a lot of these variables, we're seeing similar effect sizes. And then this is uh, all three pools. And so 
there's sort of two things that I would like to emphasize here. The first is, look at the similarity between these two patient populations um, across all the different floats. We're seeing very large effect sizes, very large reductions in state anxiety and stress, very large increases in refreshment, serenity, and relaxation. Um, here is the body dissatisfaction. You can see that on the final float, you get the largest effect. Um, but the other thing that we really have to acknowledge here uh, is that we have this chair condition. And uh, some of you may, may not uh, agree that this is floating, but these are people who were lying supine in a room with uh, the lights dimmed um, and with less sound. Not to the same extent as the float pool, but you can see that there are some effects um, that are similar on some of these variables. And so I think that uh, future research is going to need to um, uh, evaluate uh, what are the relative influences of modulating the environment. And if you can't get access to a float pool, are there other ways that you could temporarily uh, alter your environment to get some of the effects? Clearly, we see that the effects uh, increase over time. You can see over here, energy, happiness, and positive affect continue to build. But again, just thinking about what is this reduced environment that we're talking about. Uh, just to finish up, uh, in the participants' own words, uh, here are what some of them said. So we asked them after each float, what did you experience? This is just a, a sampling. This person said, uh, I didn't feel my outer body for a good amount of time, so that felt really refreshing. And I noticed that even my view of my physical appearance before and after had changed a bit. So this would certainly go in line with some of the body image uh, changes that I showed you. Another person said, I could feel my breath and hear my breath uh, and hear my heartbeat, uh, feel my heartbeat. And then I experienced not being able to feel my outer body for like not the entire time, but a majority of the time, and then just feeling relaxed. Another person said they felt relaxed, uh, a little more focused than before. My mind is not quite as loud as it was before. Right. And uh, another one, uh, another subject said, my back quit hurting. I was in no pain, and that was the best part. I was in so much pain when I came in, and the pain was just gone for the rest. Uh, I think many of you have probably seen these reports and heard these reports from individuals before, uh, but to see it in, a, in the context of a research study um, in a clinical population that's so, so severely affected, I think, is quite positive. Um, now, this was a safety study, so we want to know what are some of the negative uh, effects uh, of floating or the potential negative effects. So here, this was actually the first question we asked people. Any negative experiences during the float? And this is all 21 uh, subjects' responses. Not regarding the float, not at all. Nope, no, not really. Um, not really, no, not applicable. Uh, this person uh, got salt in their eye. They dropped the towel in the water again, uh, which is not very helpful if you want to wipe your salt eyes with a wet towel that is also salted. There's just salt everywhere. I think something you guys can all relate to. Um, I would say that we, we do still see some evidence of people experiencing anxiety in the float, uh, like Justin talked about. This person said they felt uh, a short time of panic. Um, they, they were in the dark. They felt like I can't communicate uh, with the uh, research coordinator for some reason, but that was my only negative experience. And this was not enough for, to, to get the person out of the pool. Uh, but again, this, this is likely to happen at times, and uh, you really want to be vigilant um, for when it happens and how you'll respond. So uh, the implications of the study are very simple. Um, this is an initial clinical trial. It's not a randomized clinical trial, um, but it, it is a study that suggests that individuals with anorexia nervosa can safely tolerate the physical effects of floating, and they may experience improvements in some of the symptoms of anxiety, mood, and body image as a result of floating. So a lot further than where we were a year ago. Right? Um, and what does this indicate that floating in my opinion, uh, should be studied for clinical benefit um, in eating disorders, particularly in people who are more acutely affected. So this was a study of the walking well, um, and it's a great first step, but most of those people weren't orthostatic to begin with. Their symptom severity was lower. Um, we have seen evidence that some of the more recalcitrant symptoms appear to budge somewhat, like the body image disturbance. Uh, 
But what we really want to do is we really want to follow this up with a study in more acutely ill populations and see how we can integrate this with other forms of treatment for eating disorders. Uh, so I'd just like to acknowledge uh, all of my colleagues, uh, especially Justin, Henry uh, Ye, who was our biostatistician, Scott Mosman, who's the director of the Eating Disorders Program, uh, Valerie Upshaw, who's my research coordinator, who uh, we could not have done the study without her. She's, uh, she's a, a nurse. She was there for safety monitoring, um, and my entire lab, uh, and the funding from the William K. Warren Foundation, and especially to Ashkan, Graham, and Jake for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.